alcohol, quote, gave me this confidence and, you know, what we call liquid courage, um, I now understand is really a facade. You know, it, alcohol is really just activating something that's already in you. Like you have this intrinsic courage already. You don't need the alcohol. All right, Sober Stories crew, welcome to Tani and Laura to the Sober Stories podcast. Welcome, Tani. Hello. That was kind of a jumble of words, but we'll go with it. I am so glad you're here (laughs) and so excited to have this conversation with you. I think it's going to be a juicy one. I'm here for all things juicy. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Good. I'm glad we're on the same page here. So uh, for those who don't know you, for those who are unfamiliar with you in your work, can you tell us more about who you are as a person and then we'll get you, get to your story in a little bit? Yeah. So I, I like to say I write about all things sex, sobriety, rock and roll. Mm-hmm. I came from a a rock and roll family. My My father was and is a heavy metal musician. So I grew up around oh. that that world. (laughs) And, um, so that, you know, you could infer a lot of my alcohol (laughs) use (laughs) from that. That's a whole other episode, I think. Uh Um, yeah. But, um, and you know, Mike, the, I co-host a podcast called recovery rocks, where we talk about Lisa Smith and I talk about recovery and rock and roll. Um, and I've, you know, recently just, I've, the internet started calling me the sober sex expert Mm because I, I write and talk about all things, um, sex and sobriety because when I was early, like when I was newly sober, the thought of dating, let alone Mm. having sex without alcohol scared the hell out of me. And, um, so that is, I essentially became the resource that younger me needed. Mm, I love that. And before we dig into the juicy stuff, and that's so interesting about the the rock and roll thing. I didn't know that backstory. But before we dig into that, can you tell our listeners where you're located, what your technical like job title is, who you do life with, all of the kind of high notes there? Yeah. Um, I'm in New York City. I am, I am from Central Texas, Waco, Texas. Did um, I know that? Probably not. I don't probably know. Because you're in not. Austin, okay. right? Yeah. I'm in Austin. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, story I grew away. up in Waco. Like I oh. grew up in so the heavy metal part. Mom and I, me, mom and dad were in Northern California. Dad was in the San Francisco heavy metal scene. Mom and I moved to Waco when I was eight. So I, I kind of grew up back and forth. Um, and then I moved to New York in 2015. Oh, and interesting. Um, yeah, so I writer, podcaster. Um, I have my I have a a partner. My boyfriend is also in recovery, which is I'm very grateful for that. And a proud cat mom. Mm. Yeah, I, we were Tani and I were just uh, admiring her cat's pose right before this because if you're watching the video, you might be able to see her in the background just languishing. And we both would let uh, aspire to be her cat. The presenting partner of Sober Stories is Liars Non Alcoholic Spirits. That's Liars as an L Y R E, like the Australian liar bird, which can mimic just about any sound. Like that fancy Aussie bird, Liars was created to replicate and replicate well as many different alcoholic spirits as possible, allowing us to drink our way. Now that the sun is shining and the birds are chirping, plan ahead for your next spring barbecue by packing a cooler of spectacularly crafted non-alcoholic cocktails to have in hand when they ask you what you'd like to drink. Liars has your sunshine days covered with their pre-mixed beverage line. They're easy, festive, and made for the season. With five different opportunities for celebration, the Classico's our favorite, Liars canned selections are the Sober Stories team's go-to for fresh alcoholic-free sips. Head over to Liars.com and use code SOBERSTORIES1010, that's the number 10, the word 10, for 10% off your purchase. Liars gives you the freedom to drink your way, to not just provide an alternative to those who don't wish to imbibe alcohol, but to ensure that everyone can enjoy the mirth and the merriment of a soiree or shindig. Um, okay, so let's dig into the good stuff then. So tell us the story of you and sobriety. How did you come here? Where did this start? Yeah, well, you know, when I was in Waco, I um, I got a job in the restaurant industry. And if you or listeners are aware, um, the restaurant industry is a pretty boozy place. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I got in that scene around uh, like 16, 17, you know, hostess, started bartending, waiting tables, and really it just, it became my life. I was your stereotypical party girl. I mean, Mm. textbook, (laughs) you know, Um, I was, if I wasn't serving drinks on one side of the bar, I was on the other side of the bar 
being served drinks or mm. I was dancing on it just depending, <laughs> you know, depending on which song was on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, yeah, I was the stereotypical party girl and I, I got so, you know, I don't like to talk about the, the mess a whole lot just because it's yeah. in the past. Um, sure. I'd rather focus more on the message, <laughs> if you will. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, f- fast forward to age 29, I'm in New York city to pursue writing. And, um, I, I've been in New York for four or five months and I had just, I blacked out for the last time. And I was just, I looked at Mm. myself in the mirror and I was like, this isn't cute. I don't even know if Mm. whoever was cute. Just, you know, I look in the mirror and I'm just like, my my face is bloated. I have last night's mascara flaked onto my cheeks, Mm. um, bloodshot eyes. I had missed another workout, you know, it's just, yeah. And you know, all while saying I don't have enough time to write. So, mm. um, so something clicked in me. I was like, I just, you know, I spent four hours in a pub yesterday, but I'm thinking I don't have time to write. So I, I finally had this light bulb moment of, oh, maybe alcohol is not serving me. Maybe it's actually a yeah. hurdle. Mm. And um, so that morning I decided I'm not going to drink for a week, not going to drink for two weeks. Then my 30th birthday was coming up and I was like, okay, I'm going to spend my 30th year alcohol free Hmm. and I'm going to blog about it. So I started a blog called Sobriety Party, Sobriety E-A Party. We love a pun. We love puns. And that was just, that was really how it all began. It was just supposed to be a year long social experiment. You know, like we didn't have the word sober curious back then, but that's definitely what I was, you know? Hmm. And um, here we are six and a half years later. And um, I would say the social experiment worked, removing yes. alcohol from my life. Um, my my writing career drastically improved my mental health, my relationships, my happiness, my physical health, my mental health. Um, and I mean, I'm, it's not to say that sobriety is like a free ride. It's hard. It's really right. hard, right. you know, but um I partying and was also really, really hard, a really hard life. So it's yeah. just, I guess you have to choose with the difficulty that you're going to live with. And, um, mm. I chose, I chose the sober route. <laughs> hmm. You know, that's so interesting. Cause I feel like sometimes I talk to people that are like, it would, I just, it'll just be easier to go back to drinking. I'm like, but is it easier? Is it easier? Like, if it was easy, why did you have this thought of this other way in the first place? I think that's a really interesting thought. So I want to know more about this rock and roll life. Like, tell me about that and what that has looked like before and after quitting drinking and how that has played a part in your life. Yeah. So my my dad was in a, you know, an, an 80s hair metal band called Vicious Rumors. Amazing. Amazing. Um, they had a couple of videos on MTV and they were they were pretty big at the time. You know, he he toured the world and um, which looking back on it, I can think that that was cool. But at the time, yeah. I was a little girl who needed a dad and mm. that was really, really difficult. And so even when I when he was home, when I when he was, you know, this is back in San Francisco, when he was around, um, my time with him was at the rehearsal studio, at the records, at the recording studio, um, at the guitar shop. Um, so it was, you know, that's, and I'm not complaining. That made me who I am. I mean, I, I, I learned so much about music and my mother's not a musician, but she was his, um, they're, they're not together anymore, but they're friends now. And so she was like his, his groupie. She's like, I just grew up basically like music was my religion. I was mm-hmm. quizzed <laughs> on, you know, who sings this song? What, who, what, you know, we're watching music videos on MTV and I needed to know who the band was, what the song was called, where the band was from, what album it was from. I need, so I have this vast music You're trivia. <laughs> such a great person to have on a trivia team. Like, can I sign you up for the next trivia round I do? <laughs> Absolutely. No, like there's, there's going to be a moment in my life when all of this trivia is going to like 
get me get get me out of a situation or win me a bunch of money or totally. you know it's yeah so music has been a huge part of my life i'm not a musician i've i've tried <laughs> it's not um i'm not a musician i i i've <laughs> written you know like poetry and lyrics but writing is more my um my medium you know that's mm. my that's my creativity with, with that i got from my dad and um i will say that going you know going to concerts was a big part of my partying you know i was I grew up watching these long haired, tatted up, leather clad dudes chugging whiskey. <laughs> so I felt very yeah. at home in a bar and at a rock show. So I that was a lot of my life was going to rock shows. And um, it was really difficult for me to learn how to be sober at a concert. It's still hard sometimes, yeah. um, but it's uh, I think it's just so ingrained in who I am that it's I uh it, yeah, it's just, it's such a big part of me that I, I just, I love music so much. Well, and I think you can always learn to love the same things you love in different ways. And it's interesting that you say it's still hard sometimes. And I think that that's really important that, you know, even six and a half years in, we can go to old familiar places and still feel that thought or at least have the thought and, and kind of put it away. You know, I think that there are so many really cool parts of your story that I think obviously make you a great follow on social media <laughs> and TikTok. But tell me how you became the sober sex expert. How did the internet <laughs> dub you thus? Well, you know, speaking of sober curious, the person who came up with the term sober curious, Ruby Warrington, um, mm -hmm. she and I did an event together at a, a non-alcoholic bar in Brooklyn called Getaway. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I was, it was a live recording of her podcast where we just, we talked about sober sex and she introduced me as the sober sex expert and it just <laughs> kind of, it stuck. And I uh -huh. leaned, I leaned in as they say. And, yeah. um, yeah. So, I mean, like, I guess I, I'm jumping ahead there, but like I said, early sobriety was really difficult for me to date, have sex. I was like, I didn't really know what to do. I think I, I have, I didn't mention that I, I didn't do AA. I didn't do 12 step. I didn't have a mm. traditional support group because I started a blog. I would not recommend yeah. that to anybody. <laughs> totally. That's, totally. That is, I mean, I, I don't know any other way, but looking back, I really wish I would have done it differently. But anyway, mm. um, so I was already this like semi- public person who was like, my sobriety was just public facing. And I was like, on Instagram, on my blog, like anyone else struggling with this, this is really hard. And yeah, they are, we're all struggling with sober sex dating mm -hmm. and relationships. So I started writing about it from a personal experience, but interviewing people and then reading about it, noticing how alcohol and relationships, alcohol and sex show up on film and television and music videos. And um, so it, you know, eventually turned into the main thing that I write about now, you know, like I'm, I used to, I was a music journalist and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not doing that really anymore. It's my, my writing really is about the intersection of sobriety and sexuality now. And um, we're, you know, working on a book and just riding the wave, I guess. So when you say that it was really hard in the beginning, what felt so difficult about pairing this idea of sobriety and having sex, being sex, sex sexual, <laughs> of being sexual, of, of having sex, having a partner, all of these things, what felt particularly difficult about that? Yeah, it's, I think it was the fact that once I got sober, I realized that so much of my sex and dating took started in a bar, you know, my relationship mm. started in a bar. Um, I was sleeping with people I met in a bar. I, and then those turned into relationships. Some, you know, they would sometimes be a hookup. They would sometimes turn into a long-term relationship. Um, and when you're no longer going to the bar, it's like, how, how am I going to meet people? And right. it, it's not just the location, but it's, you know, it's what alcohol gate, you know, alcohol quote, gave me this confidence and, you know, what we call liquid courage. Um, I now understand is really a facade, you know, it, alcohol mm -hmm. is really just activating something that's already 
in you. Like you have this intrinsic courage already. You don't need the alcohol. And it took me a, a long time to learn that and get really comfortable with my own with my own voice, with asking for what I want in bed without without a drink for mm. even like not even talking about sex, but even saying like what restaurant I want to go to. You know, like mm. I was just advocating for what I wanted was mm-hmm. such a foreign concept because I was such a people pleaser. I wanted validation from others. I wanted attention. I wanted I just wanted to be like this fun party girl who didn't really have a bunch of feelings, you know, and mm. then um, you get sober and you're le- you find out you have a lot of feelings. Mm. Um, you know, my friend Victoria Towery says it, her, the way she says it is I am not needless. And she says that in this, this, an affirmation, you use it as an affirmation because it's so easy to forget that our needs, desires, wants are valid. And even something as simple as, is picking the restaurant can be difficult, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I asked that question because I knew the answer and, and I know the answer <laughs> from personal experience. I mean, I'm four and a half years sober and realized when I quit drinking that I hadn't had sober sex with my long-term partner in like years, maybe ever. Like we started dating when I was 21. We started dating when I was drinking and There's such a vulnerability that comes from – sorry if my mother-in-law is listening to this one. Sorry, Kathy. Uh, She does listen to the podcast sometimes. Hey, Kathy. But there's such – yeah, hey, Kathy. Uh, There's such this vulnerability that comes from being in your body and being with somebody else in this intimate way and not having that buzz or that numbing agent or just that kind of like separation from – you and what's actually happening in the moment. And so it's such a vulnerable experience. And I, I work with a lot of women who find the same experience. Like I've never actually had sober sex or I've always met people with this, this part of this interaction with alcohol, or, you know, I don't know how to feel confident in bed or, and I think it's, it's something that people don't talk about. And I know you and I, we had a, a panel submitted to South by Southwest, <laughs> which I feel like we have to resubmit because that didn't get picked, but about sober sex we will. because it's it's such a, a conversation that people aren't having. And I think especially having grown up in Waco, you might understand this too, but like there's this idea of purity culture and we just don't talk about sex and women and sexuality enough. And so many people are undereducated and afraid to talk about these things and then add all of this on top of it when you do it without any alcohol or do it without any liquid courage. So what does that, I mean, how has this started being incorporated in your work? Tell us about your book. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I agree with everything that you said. And um, so, yeah, my book is called Dry Humping. It's a a (laughs) booze-free guide to sex dating and relationships. And, um, yeah, I had to fight to keep the title. It was, uh, Mm. it was a thing, but, um, I mean, I'm talking about it as if it's on the shelf right now. It's not, it's, Uh I'm I'm writing it. It comes out September of 23. Um, I just announced Mm -hmm. the book deal a couple of weeks ago. And, um, so yeah, next year (laughs) I'll come back and we can talk about it. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, I, I initially started writing this book as a memoir and I realized, after a couple years of working on it, workshopping it, getting feedback, and r- I realized I don't want to write a memoir. <laughs> I realized mm-hmm. that, you know, like when you work, sh- when you're in these writing workshops, people are asking questions about the writing or they're giving you feedback on the writing. Like that's why you're there. And I realized I didn't want to answer the questions, the very valid mm-hmm. questions that people had, that people asked that filled in plot holes that moved the story along. I felt very defensive of those moments. And I was just like, those are mine. Those are my moments. Why? Mm -hmm. I didn't say this, but in my head, I was like, why would she ask about that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know? And I was like, okay. And here you are as the the (laughs) sex writer who bears her soul on the internet. I know, but it's like, it's so funny because like, I love talking about, I love talking about sober sex and dating, but not necessarily my sex life. If that, Mm. if that makes sense, I'm obsessed with. So with all that being said, I stopped, I changed the, the trajectory of the book. I was, I pulled myself out of the story and I was like, look, I'm obsessed with the conversation of 
like what role does alcohol play in sex and relationships and dating? And how is it represented on film? What is that? What is the, that pop culture influence doing to us? That's what I'm obsessed with. So mm. I'm writing this book. For, it's it's more from a journalistic perspective. There's mm -hmm. obviously some of my personal anecdotes in there, um, but it's not the Tawny story. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's it's a it's um, it's research about you know what alcohol is literally doing to our bodies, what it's doing to how it's inhibiting genital response, mm -hmm. um, talking about how 75% of rapes are mm -hmm. the, the attacker is under the influence and how alcohol is the number one date rape drug. And, right. you know, these are things that people aren't talking about. And um, I'm, I'm shouting them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and, and even something so simple as this idea of what is the word you used? Genital, Mm. response response yeah even this idea of genital response people are mind blown when we say did you know that you're not feeling things as much as you would if you weren't drinking or you're like being uh, you're inhibited in general from like even having an orgasm if you've had enough to drink mm -hmm. like just this concept of what it actually does to our physiology and how that impacts our actual experience and going back to this idea of not being needless and being able to enjoy and have pleasure and feeling good. It's really interesting. And, and I'm so glad there are people like you sh shouting this because people don't know. One of my favorite things about the evolution of the non-alcoholic beverage industry is the introduction of ready-to-drink options. And this summer, I've been packing our cooler full of Dessois, spelled D-E-S-O-I. If you haven't already fallen in love with Dessois from their gorgeous packaging, then maybe you know them as Katy Perry's brand, a line of sparkling non-alcoholic aperitifs packed with adaptogens like reishi mushrooms and ashwagandha to help you de-stress, relax, and let loose without the ethanol. What's an aperitif, you may ask? Popularized in France and Italy, the aperitif or aperitivo in Italian is a bittersweet botanical beverage meant for sipping slowly pre-dinner. My favorite flavor so far is Golden Hour, a bright sunny sip with notes of warm citrus, lemongrass, and leafy herbs. Try it yourself with code Sober Stories. S-O-B-E-R-S-T-O-R-I-E-S and save 15% off your first purchase at drinkdeswa.com. That's D-R-I-N-K-D-E-S-O-I.com. So I, I like this idea of pop culture and alcohol and sex. What is your, what's your hypothesis there? What do you see? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so much of my book is sex in the city references. My editor mm. actually was like, you have too many Sex in the City references, so maybe that's my second Mix it book. Up a little of, bit. <laughs> okay, um, but you know, there's a. Are you a fan of the show? Have you seen? I've did seen, you watch it? I'm, I'm familiar with it. No, I okay, was a little so, bit young for it, but I'm I'm familiar with it. I've well, I've seen every episode more than enough times for both of us. So okay, I'll. Uh, so you know, there's there's a. You don't have to watch the show to know that it's four women drinking cosmopolitans, having sex and talking about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, per, you know, there's one scene in particular that I really analyze in the book. And it is when, um, Carrie is dating, um, a character named Jack Berger. He's another writer and she, they have bad sex. So she gets drunk <laughs> to psych herself up to talk mm -hmm. about the bad sex with him. And <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the first hundred times I just thought it was funny. But then once I rewatched it while working, you know, from a new headspace, I was like, if Carrie Bradshaw, you know, like the like America's sex writer, if Carrie Bradshaw mm -hmm. needs sex or needs alcohol to talk about sex, like what the hell are we supposed to do? And, right. you know, that's something that like I, I really like hammered down in my book proposal of like, this is what it's doing. Like, I love the show. I'm mm. obsessed with Carrie Bradshaw. I'm obsessed with Sarah Jessica Parker. I'm not knocking the show. That's just one of the many, many examples of how liquid courage is portrayed on screen and how mm. we are just inundated with these messages of sex and alcohol being intrinsically linked. Mm. So if you were to give a counter message to that, what would it be? I mean, like I said earlier, like you don't look li liquid courage is a facade. It's it's not real. You already have th that courage in you. Like 
Carrie knew what she wanted to say because she said it to her girlfriends before, mm. but she needed quote, I'm saying needed in quotes here. She needed yes. the, the, she needed those two for one margaritas to talk to him about it. And mm. that I think is just pretty mind blowing to me. So I think my counter message is Carrie already knew what she needed to say. You already know what you need to say. I think the real work is identifying what you need and mm. getting the confidence to to ask for it. You know, whether it is mm. acknowledging bad sex or asking for ordering what you want and saying you don't want to share a mm. meal for a date, you want your own plate. You know, like you start small with stuff like that and you know, you, and I think for women it's really difficult. We're not taught to be sexual. We're not taught to advocate for what we want. So we do have an extra layer to work through there. And I'm just here to tell you that you are absolutely deserving. Like if you're listening, you're absolutely deserving of pleasure and communication and you don't need alcohol to access it. You know, how did you start to access that agency and to start to learn how to communicate your needs, not just in a sexual connotation, but even this idea of restaurants or meals and stuff. How did you go from feeling the difficulty of that to being able to advocate and express those needs? I mean, therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, plug I mean, for therapy always. <laughs> plug for therapy, but I mean, you you really have to want to do the work, and I think that's mm. a big deterrent. Taking a shot of tequila is so much easier than talking to a therapist about self-esteem. <laughs> Let's be real. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we we go to that shot of tequila. It's just easier. It's accessible. It's it's cheap. It's it's easy. It's just it's right there. Um, therapy is expensive. Therapy is inaccessible. Um, even if talk therapy is not your thing, you know, there's tons of free peer support groups that people are just intimidated by. Um, to mm. admit that they need help with something, you know? Um, so I, I think you have to really want to do the work. You have to really want to figure out why you drank in the first place. For me, I, I learned that it was a source of confidence for me. And I had mm. to figure out why I didn't feel confident in the first place. I had to deal with things that I had repressed from my past I had to find a partner that I'm comfortable with to ask for what I want. I had to spend a lot of time alone figuring out what mm. I actually want. And those are those are all way harder than taking a shot. So much harder. But then again, like we said at the beginning, sometimes it isn't the, the easier option to take the shot when it gives us all of the, the consequences that come afterwards. So I know in your work, in your sex and sexuality work, part of that is your identity as a bisexual woman. I know you mentioned having a, a male partner, I believe is what you said. So yeah. what has the evolution of your sexuality and your identity looked like as you have gotten sober, been sober? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very privileged in my queer journey because I, I have, um, I have a gay uncle and a lesbian aunt. So I grew up knowing that this is just normal. This is a way to be. And mm -hmm. I never felt any shame for, for my sexuality. That didn't mean I didn't feel confusion <laughs> that, you know, I still mm -hmm. felt there was still a lot of other feelings, but I think growing up, knowing that it was okay gave me a big head start on processing those mm. things. Um, I remember be, I was 14, you know, watching TRL after school. And if youngins are listening and don't know what that is, it was the MTV show. Huh. You, 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 <laughs> you get home and you watch TRL and you see the top 10 songs and you crush on Carson Daly. Anyway. Um, yep. All the time. Again, by... The, the song again by Lenny Kravitz was on and um, the I saw the music video and it was him and Gina Gershon and just something in me. I was like, whoa, like both of these people are really hot. <laughs> you know, I was mm -hmm. like, I want to make out with both of these people. <laughs> and 
and that was like the beginning of of just realizing the awakening. Like, yeah, it was the awakening. I was like, oh, cool. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't act on it with women until I was like nineteen or twenty, and you know, to this day, all of my long term relationships have been with men. And I think for me, the work and where sobriety comes in is really accepting that I am bisexual enough. You don't have to Mm. activate. You don't have to sleep with a certain Mm -hmm. amount of women to be bisexual. You don't have to. There's no like punch card or uh, valid. There's no (laughs) validation card. Your library card. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to do any of that. Um, So, you know, I struggled for a long time. My my friends knew that I dated men and women. It was, just, but I just didn't feel like I could say I was bi because most of my long term mm-hmm. relationships were with men. Like it sounds crazy now, um, but sobriety gave me that clear headspace to actually learn about bisexuality and watch mm-hmm. shows with positive queer representation. Show watch shows that have bisexuality with nuance. Sex in the City did not give us that. It did right. not give us that at all. Um, they they told us that bisexuals were greedy and we needed to choose. Yeah. Um, so, you know, no longer being hungover and no longer being drunk, I was able to focus on my mental health and get like, you know, like we've been saying, get to know ourselves. And I was able mm. to learn about the LGBT community more and learn more about what that B is all about. Mm. <laughs> and mm. um, yeah. so, yeah, for about three months, uh, three years into sobriety, I um, I was like, OK, I'm bisexual enough. I'm going to like I'm going to claim this. And I I mm. told my my partner was very supportive. It is very supportive. And um, it's just, he's very he's in he's validating. You know, sometimes he'll just he, he was like. You know, you could be with a man or a woman and you choose to be with me and like just little. Oh, so sweet. I it's know. So like, <laughs> it's so wholesome, so sweet. But like, I think moments like that are so validating and at least for me, like necessary to because it can bisexuality is often seen. It's like the invisible sexuality, because like regardless of mm-hmm. the gender that you're in a relationship with, you're seen as that like you're gay, right. either gay or straight. And it's either that or people think that you're polyamorous just because you're bisexual. Mm. It's like, no, like, I just want one at a time, (laughs) you know? Um, So, yeah, I'm rambling. No, I mean, I think that there's so much into that. And the the, the piece that stuck out for me is really getting to know yourself in sobriety. And I think that that experience happens for a lot of people of – along with realizing what we need and want and desire, who we really are. And there's so much disconnect that comes from drinking. It just makes it so easy to be complacent and stationary and small and in the boxes that we're supposed to fit into. And it's so interesting to see people remove alcohol from their lives and then realize like, oh, wait, I fit in all these other boxes or I don't fit in any (laughs) boxes or like I'm going to make my own damn box. And I think that's such an important story to share for the people who may be having that confusion or as you, you said, used to feel not queer enough or all of these different ways of being and, and, in discovery or out of discovery of oneself. And I think that also when we think about the way alcohol impacts the LGBTQIA community, it's it's another facet of this to say like, here, I'm queer and I'm sober and I'm proud of this. And this is how I got to this. And this is what this looks like for me. So I know that you do a lot of research in this area. And I've noticed you've You've talked on social media about some of the research in the asexual community. Can you speak more to what that looks like in intersection with alcohol? Yeah, absolutely. So something that I've come across in my research is studying how many asexual people. So to to back up a bit, asexual is, you know, people, the, the spectrum of asexual people that are not necessarily just not necessarily sexual. That doesn't mean that they don't have sex, but sex may not be like as as important. Um, and there's nuances. There's different sexualities on the asexual spectrum. Um, 
But for all intents and purposes, let's just keep it simple that, you know, asexual people that are just that are not having sex, not very interested mm-hmm. in sex. Um, a large percentage of the people that are asexual and sober that I've interviewed, actually all people that I've interviewed that are asexual and sober have told me that they used alcohol to try and make themselves mm. like sex. And mm. that blew my mind and broke my heart at the same time mm-hmm. that society, you know, like earlier you, you mentioned how it's such a puritanical culture, but we're also supposed to be very sexual. It's, it's this right. weird, it's a weird dichotomy. So people that maybe don't feel very sexual or as sexual as they quote should mm. are drinking alcohol to try and make themselves like sex. And Interesting. I, I want, uh, yeah, so I, I, that blew my mind. So I've just, I've been sharing about it because I wanted, I want to a raise awareness for asexuality mm-hmm. and, you know, sexual awakening doesn't mean getting kinky in bed. Your sexual awakening right. can mean, you know what? I actually don't like sex that much. And that's, that's, that's a huge mm-hmm moment of a sexual awakening. So I really want to acknowledge the nuances of like what sexual liberation actually means. Hmm. You know, and that's so interesting because I feel like that idea of using alcohol to force something is such a common experience, not even just in a sexual encounter is like this idea of socializing or of getting through an event or all of these things that we use the substance to quote unquote get through. And then it's like, oh wait, we don't have to necessarily do that. I, I one of the things that I tell the women I work with is like, now you have the opportunity to decide what you do and do not want to do, mm-hmm. what you do and do not actually like to do because so many times they'll say, you know, I'm really nervous about this event I've got coming up or this thing I'm doing. And I just really wish I didn't have to go and I don't know how I'm going to do it without drinking. And it's like, maybe you just don't go. Maybe you just don't do the thing. And this idea of asexuality in that same realm of like, this isn't something that is part of your blueprint of desires, of wants, of needs. And how do we start to recognize and make space for that. So what do you think, like, say somebody comes to you and they're like, Tani, I've just discovered that I'm, they say, Tani, I've, I've just realized like, this actually is not what I want to do, but I don't know how to like access this. I don't know how to put all the parts of me together. And I think like, Mm -hmm. not just within this asexual idea, but kind of broader, more sexual identity. I'm starting to put the parts of me together, Yeah, but it feels really confusing. It feels really hard. What guidance do you tell somebody as they're like starting to understand all these facets of themselves? Such a good question. And I remind people to Google, (laughs) literally just start like, that might sound so simple, but if you just let yourself Google what you're feeling, you'll find Mm words to describe how you feel. You'll find essays that people wrote because they went through that exact same thing. You might find a porn of the thing that you think might turn you on. And so I think the biggest thing is to just allow yourself to research and, Mm -hmm. you know, use, use that incognito tab, delete the browser (laughs) history, whatever you need to do to feel comfortable doing it. Um, but there's just, there's so much information out there and it's so accessible these days. And I mean, like if you're, if you're, uh, there's a fabulous book called Ace by Angela Chen, who was an asexual author who wrote about the nuances of asexuality, you know, like that book, I'm not asexual, but that book taught me so much about mm-hmm. the spectrum, asexuality versus aromanticism. I mean, like, it's just so fascinating, but like, Some people may not feel confident reading a book like that on the subway or out in public. So it's like, Mm -hmm. download it on your Kindle, download it on your phone, Mm -hmm. listen to an audio book. Like, you know, there's so many ways to get information these days. There's podcasts about everything Mm -hmm. (laughs) now. I mean, just type in a subject in Apple Podcasts, you're going to find at least five or 10 podcasts (laughs) about it, you know? Um, So as a journalist, I'm just going to recommend research. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Beautiful. I like it. And I, but I think you're right though. Like, and, and a lot of my work is based in shame and combating shame and shame resilience. And one of the takeaways that I have from that work is that there's nothing new under the sun. There is no human experience or thought or wish or desire or past that hasn't been done at some point in time by somebody else and somebody's talking about it. Mm-hmm. And though we feel like that we're the only way that one that feels this way or the only one that has had this experience or the only one who's done this thing, especially if we think about shame and like the the self-worth and the self-doubt that that impacts when we just give ourselves a moment to to step into the curiosity of like, I wonder if there are other people out there who have had this experience. I think that there's a universality there and there's a lot of acceptance and unique corners of the world where people are doing mm-hmm. things differently. And and I like this idea of, of, you know, just Googling it, researching it because there's nothing new under the sun. There's always somebody else who has had a similar experience, if not the exact one, a similar experience, a similar thought. So when you think about your work and your work as the sober sex expert and the book you're writing, what is like, what's, what's the future looking like for me? What do you wish or what do you hope comes out of the work that you do? I mean, I, I hope more, there's more sober sex experts that pop up. You know, I, I hope more people start talking about this and, I know I'm not the only person talking about it, but I think I just, I'm using a megaphone. <laughs> so yeah. um, I am shouting about it. Um, I, I think, I, I just hope that if someone reads an article that I wrote, it might inspire them to Google something or talk to their partner about something or just, just education. I mean, like really, like I'm, cre- I'm creating resources. That's, that's really that's I'm creating the resources that I wish I had back then. Mm. And um, so if, if that, you know, that's really it. If, if anyone feels empowered to learn a new word, like as a writer, once I find out there's a word for something, it makes me feel better Mm -hmm. because I'm like, Mm. Oh, I'm not a weirdo for feeling that way. Like there's a word, there's an etymology Mm -hmm. to it. Like other people have felt this before. Mm. So I find so much comfort in words and labels and, and these, and these structures. Um, and if you don't, that's totally okay too, you know? Um, but I think it, it comes back to what we were saying before is getting to know yourself. And Mm. if my work can help someone get to know themselves, then my job is done. I love that more access, more information for people to see themselves reflected in and realize that there are other ways of doing things, especially, you know, coming from Waco, Texas and Austin, Texas, we we have a lot of, (laughs) Well, Austin, not so much, but a lot of, a lot of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like restricted, restricted information for lack of better, m- yes. more mystified information. So you and I are going to have to, uh, resubmit our sober sex panel. And I was talking to Shay Gomez of, uh, no booze face yes. and we were talking about the same thing. So like, let's redo this. And maybe, uh, if any listeners here want to vote for us if we do that again? That would be wonderful because our panel did not get picked for South by last year, but maybe this year. But Tani, it is so cool to have this conversation. I could talk about this forever, but I want to ask you one last question before we wrap this up today. And that is, if you were to write a story, a book, what would it be called and why? Might be an easy answer for you. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I can't think about anything other than the book I'm already writing. So can I just okay. give dry humping another shout out? <laughs> Absolutely. We can. I get a kick out of the name and it makes me giggle and makes me think of like ninth grade. So we can absolutely go with that one. I love it. <laughs> what is yours? Oh God. Nobody's asked me that question. I, <laughs> this is why I'm the interviewer. I don't know. Maybe separate story. Yeah. But when you have we'll a see. podcaster on your podcast, you have to expect to get at least one question. That's true. That's fair. <laughs> you know, I'm going to like table that one and call an audible and uh, okay. to you on that. <laughs> yes. But please, Tani, I know. know our people are going to want to connect with you. They're going to want to find you. What do you have going on in your world? Do you have email lists? What social media accounts can they follow you on? Where are you at? Yeah, I think the the best way to stay up to date is on all of the social medias, Tawny M. Lara, uh, T-A-W-N-Y M. 
L-A-R-A on Instagram and TikTok, Twitter, all of the things. And um, September of next year, I hope you will all be dry humping with me. <laughs> oh my God. What a tagline. Are you? Did, how long did it take you to come up with that one? That's so good. <laughs> Okay, beautiful. Well, we will uh, be sure to have you back on the podcast next year so you can tell us more stories about dry humping. But Tani, (laughs) it has been so wonderful. Thank you for your time and your stories today. And I just appreciate your voice in this community. Thanks for having me.